The Tom Woods Show, episode 1726. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if you're like me, one of the most demoralizing things is when someone utters the truth and then lamely apologizes. Well, not these folks. I've got a free ebook of stories from heroic professors who told the PC mob to go pound sand. Stories from Jordan Peterson, Michael Rechtenwald, and others. Check it out at againstthemob.com. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here, joined by our old friend Paul Gottfried, who holds his PhD in history from Yale, retired as a professor at Elizabethtown College, is the author of many books, some of which we've discussed on this program, and he is the current editor of Chronicles Magazine. And I just want to talk to him about current events and what he's been writing about, stuff like that, and just have a free-flowing conversation as if the two of us were just talking on the phone. So, Paul, welcome back. Well, thank you for having me once again. You had a few columns this week that uh, made me think I should get you back on here. and They revolved around a, a similar theme, Uh, namely, what is going on with the so-called American capitalist class. And when we say that, I I, I even hate to use that kind of terminology because really I'm speaking only about the extreme elites among them. I'm not talking about the guy who, you know, runs a dry cleaner down the street, but the ones who are in the Mm -hmm. newspaper all the time and think they're entitled to an opinion on every issue under the sun. Those people are not, obviously not by any stretch of the imagination, conservative. And then you had a column that uh, just happened to mention Michelle Obama and Mm -hmm. pointed out that, of course, Americans admire Michelle Obama like above any woman in the world. And she's a fatuous, empty repeater of platitudes and literally nothing more than that. And that Mm -hmm. is just plenty enough for them. How do you, I guess this is a rhetorical question (laughs) in a way, but... How do you fight back in a society that is already, is completely against you from from the get-go? I mean, in the old days, we used to, maybe you didn't, but we used to flatter ourselves into thinking that, you know, the country was secretly with us, but you mm-hmm. know, they, they just haven't read our magazines or something. I, I just don't think we can go for that anymore. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question because I, I remember that, you know, back in the 1960s, I was a member of the Yale Party of the Right. And we used to console ourselves with the thought that everybody out there in what is now flyover country is on our side. And then we discovered this was not in, indeed the case that, you know, Michigan was full of leftists and certainly Illinois was. And Mayor Daley would, you know, was about the most conservative mayor you'd be able to elect in Chicago. And we discovered that, you know, less and less of fly or came flyover country or to use that horrible word of David Brooks, red red states, less and less of this area was on our side. And I think there are multiple reasons for that. One is popular culture. Another is the educational system, uh, m- most of which, of course, is government controlled. But even, you know, uh, the parts of it that are not government controlled are also becoming corrupted. You know, it is perhaps a sign of the time that somebody as fatuous, as hypocritical and as thoroughly odious as Michelle Obama becomes the most popular woman in the United States, possibly the most popular woman in what are called Western liberal democracies. I don't know exactly how you get a handle on this. Uh, I think for a very long time, you and I have been struggling against the bogus conservative movement, which pretends to be mobilizing against this and is really part of the enemy force. I think that the left, however, will break down. This is, uh, this is something I'm certain will happen, although I, I will not be around at that time. I'm t- I will be too old to see that happen. But it does seem to me that the left is full of contradiction. I have no idea how you know, the members of Black Lives Matter, the gays, uh, the Muslims, the feminists, how all of these people can stick together very long you know, after they've destroyed Western white Christian civilization. These people are a force of destruction. You know, I've compared them to the Nazis, and I think that's an apt comparison, except the Nazis perhaps had a more positive, uh, in some ways more destructive vision. But these, uh, uh, these people simply want to destroy. They're a nihilistic, destructive force that hate Western civilization. 
um, and hate those hierarchies and distinctions that are necessary for all civilization. But I, I don't think that they would be able to survive very long uh, their destructive, if they, the, the, the success of their destructive work. Now, if you want to say, how, how can we mobilize on our side? I think it's very difficult. Uh, it's very difficult unless we can control the opposition, which right now we're not doing. I mean, there's, you, you're not, you not only have a left, you have what Sam Francis called artificial negativity in the form of a pseudo conservative movement. Uh, and I think what that does is create an additional problem for those of us who are looking for a solution. This may be a bit of a tangent, but in mentioning the conservative movement, you made me think about, I guess, something else I wanted to ask you, what your impression has been, maybe just anecdotally, of how the institutions of official conservatism have changed under Trump. I mean, yeah, some of them are never Trumpers, but Mm -hmm. you know, four miserable years of being on the outs after eight years of Obama. I mean, these people can't last that long. I think you know, mm -hmm. some of them start to come around. D has has it changed either the, the platitudes or the, the personnel or the, the mode of operation of any aspect of conservatism, Inc., the presence of Trump? I, I think the changes have been purely cosmetic. You go on, for instance, you watch Fox News, you see all these leftovers from the, from the, uh, Bush to administration, you have Dana Perino, you have Karl Rove, then you have Brett Baer, Chris Wallace, who's probably a Democrat, a kind of, a kind of Bloomberg Democrat. A National Review uh, is sort of is never Trump, but they have not lost their, you know, their place at the table of conservatism. I picked up the New York Post today and I looked, and it was Jonah Goldberg ranting against Trump as, as a right winger and the police force who are really racist. And this was in the context of an article that supposedly uh, was telling us the left may have gone too far. I, it, to me, it is remarkable how little has changed, nor would I expect very much to change unless the conservative movement is reconstructed, which is not likely to happen. So what you simply get are, you know, are the people who were there before and some of them will back Trump, others will oppose Trump, but claiming to be conservatives and very little else will change. So, uh, you know, you have the, the same cast of characters you had before, and we continue to be excluded, of course. The, uh, they have their own, the same cancel culture has remained, which is even more interesting. I mean, the Trump revolution has been like the Reagan revolution. It has been a non-revolution. I think now, now that we've done that, getting back to the left, you know, for, it's understandable that people might want to believe that what we're dealing with is a matter of uh, debate and that the more persuasive side will win and that people who are wrong will be persuaded that they're wrong and, mm. and we just need to hash all this out. And unfortunately, we don't have free speech on college campuses, so that limits our ability to debate. But, you know, I just had James Lindsay on the show earlier this week, and he's just out with a book on postmodernism and stuff like that. And he says that, if, of course, they, they don't, there's nobody on that side, at least the that side of that side, who believes in the idea of a free exchange of ideas. And it's not this is he doesn't mean this in the trivial sense that if you go to mm -hmm. a college campus, you're going to hear a lot of the same ideas repeated without dissent. He means far beyond that, that they believe that it's built into the very structure of oppressive Western society. This idea that there is some kind of abstract, impartial reason to which we can appeal. This is actually an instrument of white supremacy, it turns out. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we can't, so I would say to anybody left who think, and any, when I say anybody left, I mean anybody remaining who still thinks, well, you know, we, we need to do our best to just promote our ideas against theirs. And I, I used to believe that too, that that's what we're all about. And, and I still believe in, explaining myself and defending myself to those people out there who, you know, actually can listen. But at this point, you're dealing with people who have come out and said that we will not engage in debate with you. We cannot. And you are reprobates and you are our enemies. Well, at, at that point, what can you do other than just fight them instead of thinking, what if I say this word rather than that word, maybe they won't hate me as much. Forget all that. Forget mm -hmm. it. <laughs> just fight. Forget trying to appease them, or if I use this word, or if I have my pronouns in my bio, maybe they'll like me more. Forget it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think that any kind of discussion with the left is utterly futile. 
that in the end, it will be the side that has the most force or the most power that will win. I mean, this is like believing that, you know, you could have a debate with Goebbels and Hitler and convince them of your position. It just ain't going to happen. What makes our position, however, more problematic is that the conservative side is complicit in all of this. And I think this this has to be emphasized. Uh, They cancel us. They're quite happy to be part of the cancel culture as long as they are included in the dialogue with the left. So that you and I may be among the few classical liberals left who believe in something like, you know, open discussion in the 19th century, you know, English men's club sense or German's men's club or whatever. Most of these people do not. Even the debates, as I've argued for years, are highly staged. You know, they're what the French call des bas dialogues. They're sort of like arranged dialogues between people who basically agree on first things. So we, we don't even have a, much of a position left in which to combat them as if that would matter. Because, you know, I don't, I don't think that any of this is going to be settled by open discussion. I think people like Jonathan Haidt, you know, uh, seem to me to be taking certain uh, addictive substances when they tell us this. He believes that there are people with like different emotions or feelings. Uh, some feelings, you know, put you on one side of the debate. Other feelings put you on other. Uh, things don't work this way. I think what you have here is really a kultur kampf, a cultural war in the deeper sense. And this will not be resolved by any kind of debate. It would be, res- it'd be resolved, one might say, by history. And I think at some point, the leftist alliance is going to break down and they're going to turn on each other. And then what is left of the other side will have a formidable task of rebuilding civilization. I don't see any other way for it to go. Now, you mentioned cancel culture on the right. What's interesting, of course, about that is that the criteria for cancellation are adopted entirely from the left. Mm -hmm. So They adopt the entire leftist platform and they say, well, we don't want to have anybody in our ranks who would be thought of, not who actually is, by the way, but who would be thought of as violating any of these norms of the left. So don't worry, we will police ourselves. Notice that it never works the other way. The, the left doesn't police itself and say, well, we better appease the conservatives by making sure that in our ranks we don't do or say certain. It doesn't happen, happen that way. And then also the other day, I got into a little here's, – here's what's been happening lately. I gave a talk last month or a month and a half ago at uh, the Mises Institute called The Fact-Free Lockdown Hysteria. And as of this moment, that video has had almost 750,000 views. Mm-hmm, I know. <laughs> so it's done. Yeah, I don't know if you were one of them. It would have only been seven hundred forty nine thousand nine hundred ninety nine yeah, right, otherwise. But, <laughs> but anyway, but so that was a big surprise to me that 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 did so, and it keeps going. I mean, it's going to hit a million. It's 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 been it's gone really well. But anyway, so in that talk that I gave, I promoted a an ebook that I had written as free on the lockdowns, and I mm-hmm. tell people in the talk how to get it. And of course, when you get the ebook, you wind up on my mailing list. So that means I've had a whole bunch of new people join my mailing list who they want the ebook and they're interested in what I have to say, but they don't really know about me. So they probably, you know, some of them, I think, expected me to be like, you know, Charlie Kirk or just, you know, mainstream voices on the right. So I thought I would test them last week and see how many of these new people on my mailing list will be put off if I say something negative about the conservative movement. Now, mind you, these people join my list because they're upset about the lockdowns. The conservative movement has been pretty timid about the lockdowns with a couple mm-hmm. of, of exceptions. They've been pretty me tooing about the whole thing. So I wrote something about not having to do with the lockdowns. I wrote one issue about the whole Nicholas Sandman thing, the Covington Catholic high school student. And I said that even though he later apologized, Charlie Kirk was wrong to have initially pounced on the kid and then said, well, now we have more video. Now we see what really happened. But the idea that you would initially pounce the way some people in the conservative movement did because they see this short video, it fits into the narrative of the stupid, arrogant white kid, you know, shouting down the noble Native American. Absolutely zero of that narrative was true. Everything about the story we were told about that couldn't have been more false. And that 
Native American guy, Nathan Phillips, turned out to be a con man through and through. Everything he said when he was interviewed by CNN about that incident was false. We know that from the video. And yet the instinct on the right was to jump. A Ben Shapiro did the same thing. Now, yeah, I know they apologized later, but isn't it revealing their instinct is immediately to go after that kid when there's no way a left winger with a comparable video would have said, well, instantly I have to go after the Native American man because I have to appease the conservatives. It would never, ever occur to them to act this way. And so I wrote this and I said, Charlie Kirk was in the wrong and I know he's young and he's still learning, but I'm telling you, your instincts are bad if your first thought is, I better go attack this kid. Well, I got some pushback on my list saying, well, you must be jealous of Charlie Kirk, all this nonsense. I, I have absolutely zero desire to live Charlie Kirk's life, and <laughs> none whatsoever. But that was their response. Instead of saying, yeah, you know, you're right, the conservative movement has these awful instincts. And, it, and it, it's not like this is the first time. It repeats itself over and over. I was deeply disappointed in these new subscribers, Paul, deeply disappointed. They have apparently not been abused enough by the conservative movement yet. They want more. No, I, I, I think you're right. I've, I've noticed the same thing, that people who read Chronicles or our website are sometimes very critical of us for going after people like Charlie Kirk. Uh, for defending at least some of the things said by Michelle Malkin or Nick Fuentes. And, uh, you know, they feel that we're not playing by the rules. And the rules are set by conservatism incorporated. I, I was struck, by the way, by some of the same things <laughs> that you noticed with Charlie Kirk and Ben Shapiro. Their instincts are leftist instincts. Mm. They're, uh, I mean, you're I mean, simply looking for people, you know, around the I, I remember when the conservative movement would try to find nice things to say about Francisco Franco. That was at a time when its instincts were on the right before uh, uh, Rich Lowry took over the magazine and pushed it all the way into left field. But I mean, that's the fate not only of National Review, but most of the conservative movement. And one, another thing that keeps striking me as, as weird is if you look at the Claremont Review, they take positions on reconstruction that are even more extreme than those of Eric Foner, you know, who was a... Uh, cradle Stalinist who, you know, is, is uh, defending the Reconstruction government, defending Lady Stevens, defending the, the Black legislature whom the Republicans put in, uh, uh, used sort of as a front for taking power. They published this guy, Alan Guelzo, who's all the way out in left field. This has become the official conservative understanding of Reconstruction, together with calls to remove Confederate statues. You don't even get pushback from Southern whites anymore. They seem to think this is perfectly fine. You know, they're, they're not even a force of any kind in the conservative movement. They just, they just buy whatever the party line of Khan Inca is on a particular day. I would, not, I would not deny that not only are we stuck, you know, with people like Charlie Kirk and Ben Shapiro, whose instincts are thoroughly leftist, we are also dealing with, one might say, uh, conservative, sort of a conservative following that also has leftist instincts. They sort of match. And I, I, I agree with you that when, you know, we say things that criticize conservatism incorporated, even those people who, who claim to be critical of conservatism incorporated will land up, you know, defending the establishment against us. That's unfortunately been my recent experience uh, also. Now, folks, let's take just a minute to thank a very important new sponsor, and that's BetterHelp. Here's how you can get professional counseling from the comfort of your own home. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to be honest with you. I've used BetterHelp myself. I had a situation where, frankly, I just needed a neutral third party to help me talk through some things and to get some feedback and advice. I needed somebody with no skin in the game to talk to, and boy, did I get that. BetterHelp is fantastic. They're going to assess your needs. They're going to match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can send a message to your counselor anytime. You'll get great, timely responses. You can schedule weekly video or phone sessions, and it's more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available. They can help out in areas ranging from depression to stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, family conflicts, anger, and more. The testimonials are out of this world. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. Well, I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com woods. 
Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash woods. Now, in terms of the Republican Party, I don't even want to talk about the Republican Party very much. I would say right now, the thing that makes you an amazing hero is that you're not going along with shutting down all of life because there's a, you know, frankly, trivial increase in risk out there. I mean, that that is right. basically what's happened. So I did visit South Dakota a couple of weeks ago where Christy mm-hmm. Nome more or less kept the, the state open. She says she doesn't need Trump's assistance plan because her place has stayed open. They're, they're not having an unemployment problem. I mean, she, you know, maybe she's grooming herself for some political future. I don't know. It's funny that Gretchen Whitmer, I guess is her name in Michigan, who's been horrible and irrational and destructive, was seriously considered vice presidential material, whereas Christy Nome languishes in obscurity for for doing what's obviously the right thing. But that's a pretty low bar that mm-hmm. I, I just just let people live. I, I just want that. <laughs> I can't get that from these people. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, I have friends in Germany with my correspond who tell me that uh, everything is locked down. And Merkel is a hero for locking down, even though the economy is languishing People are jumping out their windows and so forth. But they do allow anti-fascist groups to demonstrate, which is what you would expect. It's the same thing here. Fascism is the real virus, Paul. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to we have to do that. The whole thing's crazy. Then they just they caught Nancy Pelosi. Did you see this? The, this video clip of yes. her in a in a salon <laughs> that's supposed to be closed and she's not wearing a mask. So, same thing happened with a uh, with the mayor of Chicago. Uh, Lori Lightfoot some months ago. Mm -hmm. She was in a salon without a mask and she claimed that she was having, that she had a mask, but there are no photos with anyone there having a mask. And then there's just case after case of these people getting caught. And and of course, if you were to ask them, well, why did you do that? Don't you know there's a pandemic going on? The answer would have been, well, I made a risk assessment and decided that uh, it was worth doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that's exactly what we're saying. (laughs) (laughs) We would like to make decisions like this ourselves. Let's take a complete uh, turn from from this topic to say something about Chronicles magazine because Chronicles actually played a very, very important role in shaping the way I think back all the way in the early 1990s, back Mm -hmm. when I was a subscriber to National Review. And by the way, in the early 90s, the National Review was better than it is now. It's it's not great. But I mean, Mm -hmm. Joe Sobrin was still writing for National Review in the very early 90s. So- I looked forward to getting it and all that. I didn't know any better. I mean, I was just some kid fresh out of high school. What do I know? It's the biggest, you know, I see I see Bill Buckley on public television. That must be what there is out there. Mm-hmm. And then I came across Chronicles. And and it, in fact, the very first article I ever wrote was in Chronicles. It was a short mm-hmm. piece in 1993. Uh, oh, no, I beg your pardon, 1994, because I was writing about the um, commencement ceremony at Harvard and what it had been like with Al Gore as our commencement speaker and just all kinds of crazy nonsense that went on. I wrote that for Chronicles. I submitted it. I got it in. And and I that was a big thrill for me to actually get published. And that was the magazine. So you are the editor now. It's been around for, I would guess, since the 80s. And what can you tell us about it? Well, it's been around since 1977. And oh. I, I, I applied for the editorship under Leopold Thurman, but he would not give it to me. Because as he told my late wife, I would immediately start a war with the neoconservatives and he wanted to keep them off his back. So we landed up picking Tom Fleming, uh, whose first act was to declare war against the neoconservatives. But Leopold subsequently died of a massive coronary. So, you know, which may have been in some ways uh, caused by a war, you know, the outbreak of a war he was trying to avoid. But uh, I'm happy to say that I did receive the editorship at the relatively young age of 77 last year. I just had to wait for it for a while. Persistence pays off. (laughs) It it did in this case, yes. And I am delighted with, you know, the uh, Charlemagne Institute, which is now sponsoring it. And we have an adequate and uh, highly competent workforce. So, you know, the magazine is going to try to climb back into public view when you wrote for it in the early 1990s, I think we had uh, we had as many subscribers as National Review. If you remember, uh, the, you know the conservative wars were then going on, and we were in our side. Well, of course, we had the Paleo Conservative Paleo Libertarian Alliance, but our side 
was considered to be a match for the neoconservatives. This is like, you know, telling me that in the 1930s, Argentina was economically almost the equal of the United yeah. States, <laughs> right. right? So <laughs> we fell into bad times. Uh, the neocons pretty much wiped us, you know, off, off the map. And when we took over about a year ago, our subscription list, I think was about, we had about 6,000 people subscribing. We won, according to my executive editor, we once had 23,000 people reading Chronicles. So we're going to have a lot of rebuilding to do. We, we also have to do a lot of rebuilding with the website, which was dysfunctional for, uh, for several months. But we may be the only paleoconservative magazine around. And we remain very well disposed toward Lou Rockwell and you and the people at the Mises Institute who, uh, if you would like to write for us, we shall gladly you know, a- accept what you send. Uh, since you, uh, you know, we consider you to be an ally, and you did write for us back in the early 1990s. So this would just be, you know, going back to a magazine uh, for which you wrote as a very young man. The problem, I, as I see it, is that Con Inc. does not want anything to do with us. Uh, we publish, you know, consistently good articles which are ignored by the conservative establishment. It seems that the treatment that was accorded to me has also been accorded to the magazine. And we're going to have to work very hard to get you know, our, our, our articles mentioned somewhere else. For example, I, looked at the New York, I look at the New York Post every day, and there's certain people who are considered uh, kosher or orthodox. They always get mentioned. Even modern age gets mentioned. Uh, we at Chronicles are never mentioned. I don't suspect that you get mentioned very often either. So we're going to have to do a lot of work to rebuild public relations. Uh, in fact, we have a person who is in charge of, of marketing relations, and I think he has uh, an enormous task uh, ahead of him. Well, I'm just glad that it still exists. Of course, you are fighting the, the trend against print publications. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, I, guess, I have the feeling that some of our folks, being the cantankerous uh, dissidents we are, probably are more likely to cling to, in addition to their guns and their Bibles and whatever, the print magazine, which I still enjoy getting in the mail, a print magazine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I don't want to read everything online. I want to relax in my recliner with nothing plugged in and flip through a magazine. I mean, I just can't imagine that's so old-fashioned. Nor, nor can I, but, you know, most of the people who have stuck with us have exactly the same view and they love our magazine, you know, and they wait for it. They look forward every month to receiving it. And many of the, from surveys, I gather that many of the people who like our magazine, and I know that this sort of blows my mind also like national review. They, they read the Hillsdale and Primus regularly, <laughs> you know, they, they look at publications that will have absolutely nothing to do with us. Uh, but they do like they do like receiving the print magazine in the month, and they read us. You know, they read us quite faithfully. What is the website for Chronicles? The, the website is well. We have a blog, and then we also have a regular website that makes our printed material available to a general readership. So it's I mean, ChroniclesMagazine dot org. That's what I mean. Right, Chronicle yeah. ChroniclesMagazine dot org. And what you will find is, uh, I say for my folks. You're going to find, uh, because I have all different kinds of people who listen to me, but you're going to find it very interesting, very high quality. And there actually are debates, internal debates allowed right. in Chronicles Magazine, just mm-hmm. all the way. I just remember the July issue. You it's had, remarkable. You know, we, we, we do believe uh, in the principles of a 19th century English men's club. You know, we like yeah. people with different points of view. Uh, engage in discussion. And one of the things I, I've pointed out is that the conservative movement since the 1950s has been engaged in cancel culture. It became infinitely worse once the neocons were allowed to uh, you know, climb out of their leftist hole and take over the conservative movement in the 1980s. And it's been terrible ever since. But you know, going back to the 1950s when isolationists like Murray Rothbard you know, were kicked out of the conservative movement, Uh, This cancel culture and intolerance, unfortunately, has been a permanent aspect of the conservative movement. Well, I do want people to check out Chronicles. As I say, it it was absolutely indispensable in, uh, and and Murray Rothbard wrote for it, uh, Mm -hmm. in in getting me to think differently. It was just, just great. And I, I don't know, maybe I wrote four or five pieces over the years in the, in the nineties. And uh, there's no need to bring up any ugliness, but let's just say, uh, 
I, I briefly had a bit of a run-in with the former editor, but we're not going <laughs> to... Why, why recall unhappy moments when we have Paul Gottfried safely in charge of the magazine now? But, but chroniclesmagazine.org, I'll also link to it on the show notes page. On the show notes page, I'll also link to several of Paul's recent columns. So that's tomwoods.com slash 1726. Well, thank you, Paul, for the discussion this morning, and we'll talk again soon. Thank you very much. Okay, everybody, a couple things before we wrap up. I think some of you people know that I like to travel a lot, so this has been rather a depressing time, let's say, with all the restrictions and the difficulties getting to different places and international trips are pretty much out for the time being. So I'm trying to make the most of what my options are, and I still have three states I've yet to visit. I think I mentioned this in a previous episode, and one of them is Wyoming. So later this month, September 2020, I'm making my way to Wyoming, and doggone it, is that state spread out. All the things I want to see, I'm going to have to drive hours and hours <laughs> all over the state to see them all. But doggone it, that is exactly what I'm going to do. So I'm going to be spending a little time in Cheyenne, but, but really getting all around the state. I don't know that I'll be in any one place long enough to have dinner with anybody, but I certainly welcome any recommendations as to what I ought to see and do in Wyoming. So tomwoods.com slash contact is how you can give me suggestions and I'll appreciate those. The other thing is to remind you, this geez, this past week, the, the Ron Paul Liberty Report, once again, just keeps on delivering and I want to recommend them to you. They are good friends of mine, of course, Daniel McAdams and Ron Paul himself. So I do a lot on the virus and so do they, but they've been keeping, I don't know, their emphasis varied. So they've had an episode on just very recently about what the Federal Reserve's policy is lately and foreign policy and withdrawing from Iraq and the, the burning cities and Nancy Pelosi going having a salon appointment when the rest of us aren't allowed to, that sort of thing. All these sorts of things covered in just an ordinary week's worth of programming. It's a great little program. It's about the length of the Tom Woods show. So it's consumable on a commute. And just in case you ever run out of Tom Woods show episodes, I don't see how that's possible, but uh, you subscribe to the Ron Paul Liberty Report for free over at tomwoods.com slash Ron. All right, see you tomorrow, everybody. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of the Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.